Hello and welcome to the Global Wire Conversation. Today we are talking to Patrick Denin. Dr. Denin holds the David A. Potenziani Memorial College Chair of Constitutional Studies at the University of Notre Dame. And we will talk about his most recent book, Why Liberalism Failed, but also about issues from Hobbes to Locke and the crisis of liberalism in general. And I think on page 17, you kind of make the co-argument that I would like you, if possible, to elaborate slightly on it, which is that statism enables individualism and individualism demands statism. Right. Uh, so my, yeah, I guess the core argument is that liberalism is um, more than merely a kind of modus vivendi, a way of getting along, uh, the way in which it's typically described as a political philosophy is that it's a way for people who don't disagree on the ends or purposes of life uh, to, to get along, um, to um, arrive at a kind of a base level form of cooperation from which they can then pursue their various ends and purposes. Uh, but the argument in my book is that in fact, um, there's a kind of deeper a kind of formation that takes place in a liberal order that actually uh, kind of uh, uh, shapes the whole kind of moral psychic dimension and fate of the human person. Uh, and at the core, it's the uh, it's the it's the sort of collective effort you could say to liberate human beings from uh, the kinds of arbitrary relationships that you know, certainly might once seem to have dominated human life, uh, everything ranging from one's life and membership in a family to community to church, uh, uh, of course, even to the nation today, that these are all regarded as arbitrary, unchosen forms of membership or relationship, and that the purpose and end of liberalism becomes to liberate us from these forms of, uh, of membership or relationship. And so ironically enough, to become the kind of individual that's envisioned in the state of nature theory of um, classical liberal philosophy, you actually don't, uh, you don't record, uh, re take a recourse to nature because that's not how we exist by nature. You actually have to create a fairly substantial architecture of institutions that free us, that, that allow us effectively to be freed from these various forms of membership and relationship. And so the irony is that the, the creation of the individual subject requires an ever greater, more encompassing, more powerful state structure uh, to make possible the experience of ourselves as individuals. And the deepest irony and maybe paradox becomes that the, the more capacious and encompassing the state becomes, the less free we feel as members of a liberal society. So the very, uh, the very uh, instrument of our liberation becomes, in a, in, a, you know, in a fairly paradoxical way, also the felt uh, constraint upon our liberty. I mean, it looks like what, you, what you're doing is you kind of divide a political theory, the history of political theory, into starting with the, with the ancient Greeks, uh, Aristotle, Plato, and then with Hobbes, I think you detect the change. The idea that that community and especially community is creating virtue and virtue enabling community, that this thought is kind of pushed aside and this kind of state of nature theories come in where we are supposedly all individuals and it's, in, it's institutions that put us into a community for better or worse, depending on, on which philosopher one looks at. And you kind of turn this upside down, right? You say we are actually born as community longing uh, individuals or a community longing species, and it's actually the institutions that turn us into individuals. Yeah, I mean, so Hobbes really does uh, revolutionize political philosophy uh, in that he, uh, in order to determine what human nature is, of course, a very longstanding question in philosophy, uh, elects a kind of Cartesian route, uh, follows uh, René Descartes by turning inward, uh, turning into a kind of almost psychological examination of the mechanisms that drive human behavior. And he concludes that if we really want to understand human nature, we understand human nature by under understanding ourselves as radically separate selves, as these kind of atomized selves, which is both in keeping with his, his methodology. His methodology requires us to think of ourselves as radically individuated selves, but also 
uh, is in keeping with his vision or view of what human beings actually are like, that we're actually extremely and radically self-interested atomized individuals who seek our own advantage at the expense of other individuals. And of course, this, this overturns centuries of thinking about human beings, uh, to use the Aristotelian phrase that we are by nature political animals, or the Thomistic uh, phrase from Aquinas, uh, that we are by nature social and political animals, that we are by nature uh, creatures that um, only can really conceive of ourselves as relational creatures. Uh, so I, I think um, in many ways, um, not only does Hobbes seek to um, describe human nature, but in the course of that description actually seeks to persuade us that that's what our nature is. So, so it's more than merely descriptive. There's actually a kind of very deep rhetorical and pedagogical effort on the part of figures like Hobbes to persuade us that that's what, in fact, we really are. Because that would be the idea, assuming that Hobbes wrote at a time of lots of civil strife and, and, and an area of significant violence, to if we could only kind of embrace individualism and wherever possible leave each other alone, the risk of violence would secede. And I think you, you make an, an excellent point, and I think even that the, the, the chapter title was perfectly put about the anti-culture of liberalism. And if we presume culture is something we do together, the creation of ideas or visions of liberty together, that Hobbes would be somebody who says, well, if people start doing this, this is where the problem might start. Right? You, can, you create religion, you create community around religion, but then you end up with religious wars. So wouldn't it be better if we kind of put all of that aside in the first place and focus on, on individualism? That's exactly right. Uh, and in fact, if you if you think about all the things that I just described as um, leading us to think or cultivating in us the idea that we are um, participants in a broader web of relationships and in a longer narrative of uh, of, of human history, uh, then the broad uh, designator of that membership is really culture. Culture is the way in which we, uh, you could say, our our selfhood is understood in relationship, not only with other human beings, but as I argue in that chapter, also with um, in and through time, uh, uh, thinking about ourselves as historical creatures, as parts of a woof of time, as creatures who exist not only, you could say we exist not only during the course of our lifetimes, but there's a history of us before we're born, as there will be a future of us after we die, that uh, in a cultural setting, we think of ourselves as part of a longer narrative that, that extends before and beyond our own lifespan, as well as thinking of ourselves as creatures who are um, uh, embodied in places, right? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm always struck by uh, German, French uh, names of, of, of aristocrats. If you're a German aristocrat, you have the word von in your name, or if you're a French aristocrat, Alexis de Tocqueville, that a designator of who you are is where and whom you are from. That's, that's literally the person you are. And you could say a liberal age is one that liberates us from any idea that we're a fun or de or of something or someone or some place. I mean, there is an interesting development because it starts with Hobbes and then uh, we also move on a little bit to John Locke, which I think very interesting because I think a lot of your arguments that you make will be uh, especially persuasive to people of a more conservative bent, although I think that, that regardless of one's political leaning, this is a very important book. But Locke kind of originally is understood as kind of one of the, the, the intellectual forefathers of, of, of classical liberalism, especially, but even of modern conservatism. And how would you place Locke in this, in this scenario, especially compared to Hobbes? How would, you, how would you see his role in the intellectual development of liberalism? Well, I mean, in, in, you know, I think we have to say that Hobbes is not himself a, we would not describe him as a liberal. Um, I think he introduces what becomes the liberal anthropology and the way in which we understand the basis of liberal society uh, to be formed, especially through an idea of the state of nature and the social contract. Um, Hobbes, uh, sorry, Locke is, uh, you know, in many ways both adopts Hobbes's anthropology, but modifies it. He makes us less nasty, brutish, solitary, uh, and uh, competitive, uh, that there's a kind of, there's a capacity for cooperation in, in, in conceiving of our nature, but that uh, a deeper element of our, the fact of human existence means that 
the state of nature is going to uh, devolve into a state of war. So we do need political society to secure our rights. Uh, what, what Locke really does, though, is to, is to argue on behalf of, a, of an understanding of the human self that, on the one hand, retains a strong sense of individual rights, especially the rights of life, liberty, and property. He emphasizes property, especially as a central and inviolable human right. As a result, uh, he, in many ways, deepens Hobbes's understanding of human beings as fundamentally materialist creatures, creatures who pursue the creature comforts, uh, whose satisfaction comes from essentially securing the creature comforts of life, uh, and who, in many ways, introduces the idea of a limited government, the thing that we might uh, think about as the core of what it is to be a liberal uh, politically, but a, lim a government that is limited in the sense that it is limited to securing our rights, that that's what its purpose is, that, that when we think about a liberal politics, its aim is to secure our individual rights, so that its aim is essentially to defend the private things uh, that, that we might pursue. There is no public dimension to our lives that, that, that's invested in um, government and politics. It's really its purpose is to, is to secure private ends. Uh, and as a result, in many ways, shifts the understanding of politics to the thing that we need to flourish as individuals, right? And you know, if you think today, we think about politics as really securing economic prosperity. It tends to be you know, the, the main purpose of politics is securing the conditions for economic prosperity. And that's really, it seems to me, a legacy of John Locke. But isn't that almost hidden a little bit of a, of a philosophical irony? If you look like small L liberalism these days, usually at least tends to be more anti-capitalistic, kind of kind of more kind of free market is as more looked at very suspiciously. But it was actually the free market and the, the Lockean property revolution that made liberalism possible in the first place. So it's kind of what was sending witness to the birth of liberalism is kind of what they slightly turn against. Right. So to your original question, then what's interesting, of course, to me is that Locke is now considered, certainly in the United States and perhaps in Germany as well, Locke is considered to be the conservative, the thinker that many conservatives look to. Certainly in the United States, he's the, he's the thinker who's regarded as not just the founder of classical liberalism, but in many ways, the main thinker who argues for conservatism in as much as conservatism is the liberation or let's say the relative freedom and autonomy of the marketplace for people to pursue, uh, you know, their own idea of what uh, of, of how they want to uh, engage economically with one another. Uh, of course, you're right that what we think about as liberalism, and in, in the American context, the word liberal tends to mean, I think, what in in Germany would be or Austria would be social democrat would be, mm -hmm. yeah. or on the political left. Um, what we call liberalism uh, or progressivism is a later development within liberalism. So I think the part of the uh, part of the book that has really uh, exercised uh, and both scandalized but excited many people is that I is that I argue that these two sides of liberalism, in fact, aren't as different as we tend to think that they are. That we tend to focus on the differences between the political left and the political right. But we miss the way in which there are, there's actually a deeper kind of uh, a deeper commitment that both have effectively to the, the liberation of the individual from these kind of unchosen ties. And the difference is really over the means and not the ends or purposes. The, the difference over the means is really comes down to the question of whether it's the marketplace or whether it's the state that becomes the best avenue for creating the impersonal mechanisms that will replace uh, and displace those relational forms of life in family, community, church, even nation, that increasingly um, either it would be the state or in the case of Europe, a suprastate uh, or, um, or the marketplace will be, uh, will be the two impersonal mechanisms that, that through which liberalism advances. And the, and the, in the conclusion of one of those chapters, I, I'm struck by the fact that um, while uh, individualism has increased by measurable forms in the modern era, so too have the state and the market. The two mechanisms that we regard as 
antithetical to each other, as constantly locked in battle between our political right and the political left, have both grown, have both increased, right? The market has become global. Uh, our politics has become more distant, more centralized, right? We go from the nation state now to the supranational state uh, or, or some form of, uh, of the supranational political form. Uh, and, and all the while, individualism increases as well. Uh, and yet, as I said earlier, it's not only in relationship to the mechanism, the impersonal mechanism of the state that people increasingly feel powerless, but also to the mechanism of the market that uh, uh, people feel increasingly powerless, that these individuated selves feel powerless. And what strikes me about our political moment is this rise of this thing we call populism, uh, nationalism, is a reaction both against um, a kind of a politics or a state that seems no longer to be under people's control, as well as a market that no longer seems to be under people's control. There's a kind of rejection of what has been the classical divide between the left and the right uh, for at least the last half century. Would you agree that, that another division you allude to, even though you don't address it directly, is a little bit between the Enlightenment and the Counter-Enlightenment? If I might phrase this as a, as a provocative question, a couple of arguments to make is, is that, that capitalism in the market has a, a negative effect on community, on, on human relationships. And you make a very, a very, I think, profound statement when you say that liberalism is shaping us into a creature of its prehistorical uh, fantasy, which I think goes exactly to this, this idea of what we actually are in the state of nature. But couldn't a counter argument be, well, Dr. Denin is arguing against a prehistorical fantasy by one side, but isn't this idea of kind of, a, you don't say this, so these are my words, of like a harmonious community of small community, isn't that just an other form of kind of this, this fantasy and that this kind of society never existed? This would be an argument that uh, Deirdre Mikulski, for example, would make, right? That actually capitalism allows us to join more communities than ever before, right? You can be part of the PTA and of the soccer club and uh, of the faculty club, all these kind of things. So, so there is. Do you think there could be arguments made against the idea that capitalism is making us always kind of has a deteriorating effect on on community? Well, sure. I mean, I, I in fact, at the conclusion of the book, I I argue against the idea that um, the the answer to the problem of liberalism is going back to some prehistory of liberalism, like some doubtless fanciful ideal of, uh, as you described it, a kind of utopian human community that predates uh, the capitalist uh, order. Um, but uh, in fact, you know, what strikes me is that um, what, what you just described is, uh, is often the answer that, uh, that we are freer to become the kind of person that joins a whole variety of communities we can live, we can, we, we're not forced into uh, the kinds of communities that existed before the rise of capitalism, before the rise of liberalism. One of the things that that um, my my profession, social science, political science, or sociology, one of the few things that is actually discovered, it seems to me, and there's not much that it actually knows with any certainty, but one of the few things that it actually has consistently uncovered is that we are, in fact, more and more the individuals imagined and conceived in liberal theory as a matter of fact, and not merely as a matter of theory. So it's true that in theory, as liberated, as creatures liberated from the confines of particular communities and religions and so forth, we are free to join any number of other associations and groups that we might wish to. But the fact is that we increasingly do not. We increasingly are creatures who do not uh, join anything. Uh, and here there's a raft of findings in the social science literature, everything from Robert Putnam's findings in Bowling Alone uh, to mock contemporary um, examinations of religion and religious affiliation. Uh, my colleague Christian Smith at the University of Notre Dame has really extraordinary findings on, uh, on the just decreasing uh, religious affiliation uh, that we're seeing across uh, the Western world, including the United States. Uh, even to the point in which uh, people are reporting a decline in friendship as a fact of their lives, the rise of loneliness as a central feature of their lives. So I, I think that we have to we have to acknowledge the fact that there is a very deep disconnect between the theory, in some ways, and the reality. Uh, that uh, we could you could certainly say, well, isn't that true of someone like you, who's a more communitarian thinker, uh, and isn't it always the case that it's not as utopian as you suggest. 
But I would simply say that it's simply the case that in, uh, in liberal theory, we actually become much more the creature of these radically individuated selves that I think is in many ways contributing to our contemporary political crisis. And it's not simply enough to assert the truth of the theory in response to, it seems to me, the gathering evidence of reality. Let me try to, to connect two points from your book, because one thing that I really enjoyed about it, that it is counted as a book of political theory, but especially in the area where you talk about new technologies, you give it more than just a superficial treatment, right? You really go into the data, you really go into what do we empirically know, how new technologies can affect us, especially with regards to feelings of loneliness and the changing nature of friendship. And you make a point, I think, that many people have potentially overlooked this. You do not blame, so to speak, these new kind of social media, these new networks. You say they're actually a symptom, they're a consequence. I think that's a very interesting point, that it's kind of the idea, we kind of want to be lonely occasionally, or not lonely, but we want to have the, the primary option we want to have is of individualism, of, of being ourselves. So this kind of then led to the, 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 the emergence of this, this, this lower levels of, of community. But as an add-on to this point, or two, two add-ons, two quick ones. One is, I think this probably has been the great surprise of the 20th century. It's kind of that the biggest market capitalization we see in technologies that enable community, right? That we see we see that the biggest kind of people willing to fund is kind of to, to share themselves in whatever form, whether it's via pictures, via stories with others. But at the same time, it looks like that investing time, money, commitment to these communities, that this has declined. And can this could this be connected to another very important argument that you make, which is that the idea of liberty in the classical sense was that liberty is something or that the responsible using of liberty is kind of to restrain ourselves or to, to be to to know when it's it's necessary to make a sacrifice, to know when it's necessary to kind of give up your individualism and, and, and do more for the community. But now people kind of try to have it both ways. You want to have community, but potentially you want to keep the, the commitment or the sacrifice, if one want to use this expression, for the community as small as possible. Like, you know, being doing land, people doing land, they're going to church is almost raising eyebrows in certain circles, right? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you use your time for something else when, in fact, sacrificing something would enrich these, co these communities, their communal life? And that doesn't happen that much anymore. Yeah, it's a great... Uh... It's a great framing um, uh, of this uh, of this really interesting question. Uh, I, I, so I do have a chapter on technology, and um, I, I try to make the point, which is ultimately, it's, I suppose, it's not possible to prove it. But I, I think there's a there's a different way of thinking about technology, as you suggest. When even when we use the word technology, we automatically think about you know these devices. Uh, we're talking we're talking with technology right now. We're using computers to uh, over the internet to talk to each other from a distance. It's an amazing thing, uh, and we're we're in the midst of this transformation of our society because of these pocket computers that we all carry. And that's what we tend to think of when we use the word technology: are these specific tools attached to uh, computers and internet and so forth. What I wanted, the point I wanted to make is that tech, technology, of course, comes from the Greek word techne, which is basically means something that human beings make. And so I want to have a much broader understanding of this idea and concept of technology and to think in particular about the context in which these more specific tools are actually used. In other words, what shapes the kind of behavior that leads us to be attracted to certain kinds of tools as opposed to other kinds of tools. And that leads us to use certain kinds of tools in, in such a way as opposed to other kinds of tools, right? So I mean, one interesting case, I'm married, uh, I'm married to a German woman uh, from Southern Germany. Uh, ich kann auch Deutsch sprechen. Uh, but uh, um, uh, one thing that strikes me is that both the United States and Germany have automobiles. Uh, we, you know, we both have that technology, and yet what's really interesting is that um, while I think things are changing in Germany, in Germany you don't nearly have the same amount of sprawl outside of town, certainly when I look at something like southern Germany, that when you exit a town, you're more or less in the woods. You're more or less, you know, in farmland. As soon as you hit that, the, the town, the sign of the town with the cross through it, the, the red line through it, you're at the end of that town. Uh, and so that the, there's still a sense of what the dimensions of that human community are, even though you have the automobile that allows you to move in and out of those communities with, with great ease. Uh, 
Whereas if you go to the United States, what you find is that there's no way of telling where one town begins and one town ends. They're all blended together. People are living everywhere. There is no real divide between the borders of one place to another because Americans really value being sort of separate from each other, uh, being, um, being able to move beyond the boundaries of any specific space or territory. Uh, this is very much embedded in the human spirit. Uh, sorry, in the in the American spirit, the idea of getting out to the frontier, and I think it's a long-standing quality of the Americans is is to not want to be confined to a specific sort of you know sort of defined uh, uh, um, uh, sort of civic entity, if I could put it that way. So I I guess this is just by way of saying that. Um, one can have the same tool and yet end up using them and employing them in different ways. What interests me about uh, then about what we talk about technology as, as the internet and so forth is that it does seem that in liberal societies especially, there's a strong tendency to want to use this technology in exactly the way that you suggested, which is to use it as a replacement for the kinds of community and the kinds of replacements that we increasingly don't have don't have and that we don't seek, right? That we eschew, that we avoid. The kinds of thicker forms of relationships, whether they're friendships, immediate friendships, or broader neighborhoods or regions, or again, the kinds of institutions like religion, churches, and so forth. And to use this technology as a kind of replacement, but precisely because it allows us the ability to enter and exit those relationships with great ease, right? It sets, the it sets the default of those relationships on ease of entry and ease of exit. And that I would say is a real transformation from let, let's say a conception of membership and communities in which the default is not set on easy exit, it's rather set on loyalty. Yes. Right? The default is set on a kind of loyalty to that community that if one runs into difficulties or challenges, your first response isn't simply to exit, right, to block that person or to, you know, stop that person from being your friend on Facebook or what you will. Your first impulse is to see if you can repair the relationship or change the terms of the relationship, perhaps. But it's not simply to exit. So I think uh, in many ways that what I want to say about technology is that we have to think about the deeper technology of our political organization and our social organization ourself and then think about the tools that, that we typically call technology, and that our politics or our political philosophy is a technology. And unless we see it in those terms, we'll tend not to see the deeper shaping forces of this other stuff that we call technology. I mean, I think this, because this dovetails with a lot of your arguments, and, and to you to use an example that, that, that might be a little, a little, a little uh, crude, but nonetheless, if if you you know I'm I'm a huge fan of of zombie movies and I always think that the most interesting part of zombie movies is kind of the first half hour when you see how all the institutions start to break down right the police the military everything that people rely on in their daily lives disappears and then the remaining question is whom can I turn to and trust right without having the state there who is kind of my backup if the person should betray my trust and you make a point for example you mentioned um, uh, another book that talks a lot about the Amish but I have to admit as absurd as it sounds, it might would make a great movie. But if there would be the zombie apocalypse, probably an, an Amish community would be an interesting one to turn to because I much rather trust them not to stab me in the back than any other kind of community. As you pointed out, loyalty does not, being in contact or sharing information does not create loyalty. And this, I think, is, is what people, almost, is often misunderstood is, Relations in the market are different, right, from, from personal relations. I, if, if I go into a store and I buy a cheeseburger, I don't need a loyal relation with that person. But in probably 80% of my other surroundings, I do need this, right, this kind of this personal relation. And that seems to break away. Yeah, it's really interesting. You should talk about uh, your interest in zombie movies, because I'm actually teaching Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan right now here, uh, here in London uh, to a group of students. And today in class, I use the example of precisely of a zombie movie to describe kind of how Hobbes wants to think about our lives, that we're kind of, you know, at any moment, the zombies could jump out and destroy everything, that, that, that there's a kind of deep fragility to these institutions that we think are deeply reliable, because he wants us always to be aware that but for our sort of agreement as these radical individualized selves to the state, 
our loyalty to the state, there is nothing that would hold us together. Right? We would just devolve instantly into a state of nature in which we'd be basically ourselves acting like zombies. And that's really what Hobbes wants to persuade us of. And I would say the fact that we have become so fascinated with zombie movies at a very time when Western politics itself seems to be cratering, when there seems to be no conception of common good that animates the, the, the nations of, uh, of Western society, Western liberal societies anymore, it's not a coincidence to me that the kind of zombie genre has become uh, quite prominent, as has the sort of dystopian yes. genre. I just think uh, there's, it, it's not a coincidence that these two things uh, have occurred at the same time. And you know, you mentioned I, 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 several times in the course of the book. I mentioned the Amish, and I've had some reviewers who said, "Oh, Deneen, you know, just wants us to be, all be like Amish." Uh, I really, I really revert to the examples of the Amish as the kind of really, let's say, the the visible counterexample for what a non-liberal society looks like. And I and I don't mean to suggest we should all be living like Amish, although I think it wouldn't be the worst thing if we lived a bit more like the Amish. Uh, and I give. I give as an example uh, the fact that the Amish, I mean, fascinating uh, decision by a community not to allow its members to take on insurance um, in, in, uh, in the forms that we recognize, health insurance, life insurance, and so forth, um, because what insurance is viewed as a way of, of um, impersonalizing or making depersonalized the risk of living that requires us otherwise to rely upon our communities and our neighbors. If one thinks about it, that uh, when one has an accident, when something bad happens, uh, you can, you, if you live in a modern society, you turn to the depersonalized risk pool of an insurance uh, claim uh, to make a claim on no one in particular, but a pool that a, a lot of people have contributed to anonymously. Whereas in an Amish community, you turn to the community. Uh, your house burns down, the community will help you build that house again. So I, I, I'm struck by the way in which just a different organizing principle leads to a very different, um, let's say, way of existing in the world. And because the way we exist in the world is so deep-seated, so unexamined, we assume it's simply the nature of things itself that we organize life this way. And it's simply to, to use a kind of contrast society to highlight the decisions that went into the kind of society that we built in order to allow us to reflect on those very decisions. Is that, there are two more questions, if you don't mind, that I think that, that, that go very nicely with this. You mentioned it a little bit, and I think that's probably something that's very interesting to our listeners, is kind of this rise of populism in Europe, and of course also partially in the, in the United States, and I would say on both sides of the aisle at the moment in, in different political figures. But this, at least in the case of Europe, would you would you say that the populism is the right word? Because if you look at it, these people have been saying the same thing for 30, 40 years. I mean, the, the Le Pen family in France, for example, they didn't really change their positions much. One can say they, they kind of economically, they have always been more of a socialist bent, but this idea of cultural purity or kind of, kind of a more uh, homogeneous society, it's that society moved closer to these parties, but not that these parties kind of stick their finger in the wind and say, where do we go from here? So we, we talk about populism as kind of these, these in the, and I say this deliberately provocatively, one could say they were idealists, right? They just, they stuck for better or worse, right? This is not a, a, normal, a normative judgment, but they stuck to their guns throughout time. And now it seems that society is moving more into their direction. And doesn't that slightly reflect almost an age old dilemma? And, and as you allude to this also in your book a little bit, and then in a couple of recent presentations, isn't that kind of the, the, the old, division between Anglo-Saxon kind of British philosophical tradition and German continental philosophical tradition, this, this idea that that idealism, romanticism, kind of that, 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 it, that human existence is more than kind of our, our physical presence and our material needs. And I think this has been, at least in the German tradition, be an argument immediately kind of against, against Anglo-Saxon tradition, right? I mean, it's, it's a famous Nietzsche quote that only an Englishman strives for happiness and that they have the, the soul of shopkeepers. It, so, so what do you think about this? Yeah, no, it's a great point. I, I think, it, you know, you're right. And um, uh, that these, let's say, what we now call populists, in other words, positions that are aimed to appeal to a broad mass of people, have been around in various forms in France and Germany. Uh, they've been around in the United States for some period of time, and there's an old populist tradition that goes back to the 19th century. And that, you're, I think you're absolutely right, that kind of conditions now have arisen uh, 
that have suddenly made those very salient to a large number of people. And so what are those conditions? And, and, and this is part of the reason why I think I've been in a lot of these kinds of conversations about my book, because for whatever reason, it seems that the logic of liberalism itself, right? if there is such a thing as a logic of a kind of ideology, and if liberalism is in fact more than merely a kind of political settlement, but is in fact an ideology, which is to say that it has a certain vision of human life and human society that it sort of logically will seek to put into effect, right? The same way that communism sought to do so. Then as we see liberalism, as I put it in my book, as we see it succeeding, uh, we also in some ways we see the, with vividness how it is failing, right? How it does not actually reflect a kind of deeper, form of what people think is true about their nature, about human nature and human society. And so one of the ways in which you could say that's true is the more we become the kind of figure imagined that we talked about earlier, the liberated self, the self liberated from any accidental relationship or membership, it means that we're going to become both more radically individualistic and more radically globalist. Right? Because the nation itself, which was the original container of the liberal regime, right? it was the original, you could say nations were invented by the liberals. Right? They are the, the kind of co coincident with the rise of liberal philosophy. In the end, the nation becomes too confining, uh, even for liberal society. It, it itself has to be overcome and superseded by something far larger, whether it's the European Union and ultimately perhaps a global government, some kind of globalized uh, political entity in which we are, you know, to use the Hobbesian vision uh, that, that's portrayed in the frontispiece of the Leviathan, we're all individuals contained within the sovereign, right? That's the kind of ultimate vision, I think, that, that inheres in a liberal society. And I think we're seeing in part a rebellion against that logic. Right? And it's being portrayed in different ways or, or articulated in different ways through obviously uh, um, a uh, you know, kind of response to and against immigration, I think, especially uh, in parts of Europe and the United States, but also the sense uh, of a rejection of a globalized economy uh, that increasingly benefits a certain portion of the population, a rejection of the idea that sovereignty should lay so far distant that ordinary people no longer feel any command over their political lives. I think uh, not, not uncoincident is, the, is, a re, is a reaction against the kind of, let's say, the social achievement of liberalism, which is kind of you know, embodied in the sexual revolution, uh, the liberation of the self from genders, from, uh, from marriage, from children. And I think there's a kind of, there's a coalescence where you see this you know, kind of uh, the the almost sort of pagan populist and and Christian uh, and Christians uh, conservative Christians and traditionalist Christians joining aspects of this populist movement. So I think there's a there's a coalescence of a lot of uh, reactions to what it seems to me as a purified liberalism that we're seeing coming into being, and it's realigning our entire politics no longer against our our. Um, you know, sort of comfortable left-right liberal axis, but now a much, much different axis. And we're, you know, I'm living in England right now, and I think we're seeing in real time the creation of a rather new and different kind of political alignment over the question of Brexit, as we're seeing this play out in many other countries across the West. But what do you think is is, is there such a weakness um, to to exactly what you said? I think the backlash takes place on many sides. So for example, with and this is something there's an ongoing, fascinating debate in the United States about the question of patriotism, nationalism, and how how it fits in the conservative worldview. So one can say that that I'm, I'm simplifying here, but the kind of the political right is moving more towards a form of patriotism. Or is somewhere on the on 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 the and the bandwidth between patriotism and nationalism. The, um, you have an upsurge also in religious commitment in Europe, not so much in, in Christian religion, but of course the, 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 the fact that Islam is becoming such an important topic is because the Muslim minority feels more Muslim than they did in the past. But the same is partially, we would argue, for the left, right? Their spirituality, if one excuses this expression, is more found in a new form of environmentalism, or which you correctly pointed out, I would say, the sexual liberation, right? That that kind of this is this is kind of this is more than just than just oh, I want to be what I am. It's also everybody needs to recognize it. It needs to be celebrated. But isn't the difference that without idealizing one or the other, that 
the religious mind, to a certain extent, knew that it was religious. So, 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 so and that the religious person knew that faith was a, was was an important part of it. That kind of you believed in something without knowing whether it's true. But now we kind of we still have this spiritual thinking, or we still have this this longing for faith. But we no longer can call it that we have to try to, to base it on fact. It has to be rational. So therefore, even though we're spiritual, we're not willing to admit it. So, so you have all these, these, which are basically cultural clashes, but nobody admits their cultural clashes because officially nobody is spiritual and whatever they believe is, of course, based in science and fact. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would, I would um, uh, just very briefly um, maybe uh, amend your uh, what you said about religion in Europe to point out that it seems to me that there is a pretty close tie between a certain religious sensibility in the parts of Europe, uh, Eastern Europe especially, so Hungary and Poland, where you're seeing right a kind of resurgence of both what we're describing as populism, as well as a kind of strengthened, um, very strong view that somehow a, a strengthening of the, uh, of the religious foundations of the society combined with attention to uh, you see this in Hungary, the effort to encourage uh, birth rates, uh, marriage, to decrease abortion, uh, to decrease divorce, and so forth. So it seems to me that even in Europe, uh, maybe not maybe not Germany, Austria, and so forth, but in parts of Europe, uh, there's there's been a, at least let's say a kind of uh, a sympathetic relationship between traditional religion and populism that 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 we see as well uh, in the United States. And you know, it's very interesting uh, to see these phenomena together. Um, but but to your broader question, I think one of the most interesting things that I see happening right now, uh, and it's certainly you see this in an interesting debate that's unfolding in the American conservative world, is the question of whether any political, any of the political debates that we're now seeing take place can and even ought to be taken on the on the grounds of a sort of liberal proceduralism. Right? That um that for much of um, for much of the recent history, the question has been many questions have been dealt at the level of how far and to what extent liberal proceduralism can apply to substantive questions. So a good a good case in point, of course, is in the United States is religious liberty, right? Is uh, what forms of religious expression deserve the protection of religious liberty? Uh, and what forms expression of religion um, now run afoul of state interest in, in limiting religious expression? And of course, a lot of these questions are, are centering today on questions of gay marriage, transsexuality, and so forth. So they're highly contentious. What it seems to me is happening, and it's certainly true in America, but I think probably also increasingly in Europe, is the view that liberal proceduralism is ultimately a shroud for deeper value commitments that are essentially, let's say, just religious in nature, uh, that, that both sides today, um, those who are liberal, self-described liberals, and those who are critics of liberalism, increasingly see themselves as defenders of a substantive set of goods, right, that uh, can't simply be articulated in procedural terms. And that these goods are held with the commitment of that are akin to, or in some cases, are nothing other than faith commitments. Right. So uh, you know, I'm struck. I am really struck walking around in London these days that every store, every business, every house has a rainbow flag, and it's almost as if walking around. It must have been walking around in medieval Europe and seeing every every house and place of business with a crucifix on it. Right. It is really the symbol of our allegiance today to be committed to all of the all the various you know, attendant commitments that that attend to, uh, to to the commitment to gay marriage. Right. Not simply just gay marriage, but all of the the sort of attendant forms of liberation of toleration uh, that I think are entailed and symbolized in that flag. We are in some ways in the midst of a kind of unacknowledged religious war if I could put it in those radical terms, in the West today. And, and I think it's, um, in some ways, there's still, uh, some of this is articulated in liberal proceduralist terms, but increasingly those terms are no longer capable of containing the actual value commitments that are on the table, that are being combated. And it seems to me that there is no easy way to settle a religious war like this one, because the commitments are so deeply held 
and they are so antithetical. This brings me to, I promise, my final question. I think this is something uh, our conversation is a great point to end our conversation on. As you just pointed out, it's, and, and you also refer to this in, in your book, the claim of the liberal state is kind of to be neutral, right? It doesn't make claims to the good life, but as I say, even those, those what they would call procedural things are actually hidden ideas of what the good life or the good society looks like. It's just it's just not said openly. And it seems to me that one way how this is is, is the attempt is, whether consciously or unconsciously that is to implement this, is that certain topics are pushed out of conversation. And I see, I think we see this particularly strong uh, in the United States more than in Europe, but it is coming to Europe too, right? On university campuses, in, in the entire higher education system, where very often studies, and we had a couple of cases recently, where certain studies are under scrutiny, not because of whether or not they were scientifically sound, but because they fear what effect they could have on specific views, right? And there's, there's, there's a couple out there, a paper was recently published regarding colonialism or uh, the, the rapid onset of gender dysphoria, these kind of things. And, and this is, I think, one of the more dangerous trends. And, and you make this very important case towards the end of your book is this also goes against anything that liberal education was supposed to be. Uh, kind of uh, starting with an engagement, the critical thinking first of all needs knowledge. And kind of, then you you shape yourself in, into this virtuous being, but that certain discussions can no longer be had at universities, who, which would be the places to exactly have these conversations. Yeah. Well, I you know, I'm I I, I guess the, the, the upshot of the argument of my, of my book is that liberalism uh, never was and never could be some kind of neutral system without its own commitments. And the, the thrust of my book is that there are deep, deep commitments that are held, uh, let's say, within the, within the deepest philosophical and political um, uh, uh, articulations of, of, liberal, uh, of, the, of the liberal vision of, of human society and human nature. And that what we are really living through now is the realization of those commitments in, in our actuality, in, in, in our daily lives. The result of this, not surprisingly, is that the high temples, uh, you could say, of the liberal order, which include the universities, but also include things like media, journalism, uh, many of the institutions of civil society, are increasingly articulating the boundaries of what is permissible to be said and not to be said. And for someone who teaches at a Catholic university, I teach at the University of Notre Dame, it's really interesting to watch this unfold because Notre Dame, about 50 years ago, went through a kind of deep internal struggle about whether or not it would continue to draw boundaries on what was permissible to be taught and said um, and discussed and what books could be permitted to be published and even taught in a classroom. And it was decided that in order to be sufficiently an institution of academic freedom, those limitations uh, should be put to the side. And what's striking now is that what we're seeing is liberal institutions, secular institutions, entering a period in which that seems to be the norm. It's just a different set of commitments that are now deemed to be like orthodox and sacrosanct uh, and not permitted to be, you're not permitted to be a heretic from those views. And the question to my mind in many ways is, is it possible, really possible, ever to have a completely neutral institution in which anything can be said, anything can be taught? And I suspect it's not the case. I think there's always going to be some commitments in any human society, whether it's you know, an older Catholic society, an older Catholic university, or a modern secular university, that are going to be essentially forms of religious commitment, or we could say sacrosanct commitment. And so the question to my mind is, yes, I mean, in many ways, yes, uh, uh, it, it would be better if many of these questions could be freely discussed uh, and engaged with in a university, but whether in some ways it runs against the nature of human society to say that we can brook all questions and challenges, uh, even ones that, that uh, challenge our deepest commitments. And I think that's a, that's a really interesting question that we're engaged in right now. And I find it both intellectually exciting, but also as a as a scholar and as a professor, kind of scary as well. Well, unfortunately, I could continue this conversation for hours. We have to stop here. Thank you so much for your time.